This is Season 4, Episode 2 of Mastering the RPG, a tabletop RPG podcast all about upping your game. Doesn't matter if you're a game master or player, you'll find advice, ideas, and some strong opinions. Our episode tonight, Game Mastering for a Small RPG Party, or this is a buddy cop movie. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mastering the RPG. Like I said, it's an RPG podcast. We like talking about games with ideas, cool stuff found, and we have a new segment. We'll get to that. Um, I'm Carl with my co-hosts, Eric and Chris. You'll find all the information about the show at MasteringTheRPG.com. Send us an email with feedback or questions to GameMaster at MasteringTheRPG.com. That's all one word, all together. Um, So, hey, it's good to be back on the mics with everybody. How is the gaming world treating you? How are you doing? What are you up to? Um, Chris, what's going on these days with you? What are you up to? I'm getting ready to go to Gen Con. I'm trying to Mm -hmm. remember who I have to talk to and what I have to do. Uh, I will be giving uh, Deadlands Dark Ages demos at uh, tables Thursday and Friday, I believe. And then uh, just a lot of meetings other than that. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, Gen Con's just around the corner. Deadlands Dark Ages, that's like Deadlands in medieval times or something? Yes, it is. It is uh, back in the, uh, yeah, whatever, the early thousands or something. um, Very UK-oriented. Grim Cthulhu-y, I would say. Oh, nice. Very cool. Very cool. So what what have you been up to, Eric? What's going on with your Uh, your head? (laughs) Nothing since last time. Uh... Uh, I've had some birthdays, had some trips, so nothing RPG related so far. Just getting uh, finishing on my setting and getting ready to actually write the beginning part of the campaign. So looking to start this August for with people. Very cool. Well, I mean that's you. you I mean you're working on it. You're getting close. August is just yeah. around the corner, not too far it away. Is. Not too far away. <laughs> um, Impending, especially yeah. when we got Gen Con coming up. So you know August is like right here. Um, for, for me, I've been working on getting ready for the Tabletop Tango 200 episode, numbered episode, 2.5K celebration live stream, which you will be on with me, Eric. Um, so you've got that going on. Um, that's oh, gonna, that is true. Yeah. That's going to be the 31st at 8 p.m. When this show drops, I usually drop it on Wednesday. This will be the morning of that show. So if somebody listens to this in the morning, then maybe they'll think to jump on but otherwise you'll have missed it already watch it in reruns on youtube so that's what's going on with me and uh sounds like there's some good stuff going on i can't wait to hear what what happened at gen con i'm missing gen con i'm going to game hole con but i'm not going to gen con so i'm looking forward to hearing what i missed and all the cool stuff i guess we'll have some cool stuff found probably then coming from gen con so uh, not to put too much pressure on your shoulders but congratulations that you're (laughs) <laughs> That's your assignment. So <laughs> great. I've been well, looking for cool something things. to fill the time. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, I, I did allude to it. We have a new segment um, to go along with, you know, things like email, cool stuff found. It's called Creature Corner. And this is a spotlight on a creature, whether it's in gaming, mythology, whatever, and we're gonna talk about it, kind of use it, lose it. Just have a good time with it. Whatever. I don't know. Um, and we're going to start off with, uh, I guess, a crowd favorite, right? A Bullywug. Bullywug. And so we're going to turn it over to the leader of this particular segment t- today is Chris. Chris, tell us all about the Bullywug. Ah, Bullywug. <clears throat> These frog-like creatures, I, I really like them. They are, are swamp-related. They uh, come up here and there. And, and the reason I think that they are... Uh, uh, quite useful other than say like a goblin or something very common is their origin and their society is a little bit less understood because they're less common which means you can throw them in in different spots or they could be good they could be bad they could be unknown Uh, typically using them in a swamp or wet environment uh, haggy witch environment uh, some grimdark stuff Uh, I mean really there's, there's lots of places obviously aquatic uh, so not cities. Um, but what about <clears throat> sewers? What about sewers? Sewers. Um, that's a good one. I mean, I didn't think of that one, but yeah, I mean, that, uh, 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 Bullywug away from home is a sewer candidate to be, I say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they, they, but the reason I like them is they, they have, you know, they're just so different each time. They're usually tribal, but, you know, they could have a whole different uh, society, internal politics, uh, lizard brain or not. Um, they could be working against you, working with you, uh, unaware of outsiders. Um, they really just a lot of places you can go with them. Uh, and then Bullywugs are only, you know, just one name. There's like Bogarts and Frog Folk and... I mean, they all kind of fit the same bill. Uh, tribal, uh, typically less civilized, uh, shamanistic, if uh, magic is involved, I would imagine. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I love them. I use them all over. I think that they're a great uh, uh, alternative to Goblin when you're not in an, a, f a familiar area. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has any experience with them, but I mean, yeah. I think they're pretty good. Oh, I totally agree. I, I love Bullywugs. They're cool because, like you said, like they're... When you want something that's like a tribal society or it's just a, a hidden society, right? Like the, that the main powers don't know about. They're like a good alternate to goblins or lizard folk. But I think the thing that makes them so cool is it's like frogs or amphibians are so weird anyways. So all their unique genetic features make them like a kind of nice change in pace. There's, you know, goblin and lizard folk, like they're kind of the same as far as how they fight, you know, generally. But like frogs can be like super camouflage or, you know, they have crazy jumping abilities or they can use their tongues in weird ways or, you know, breathing uh, under the water. Things like that that you could use for any kind of setting or any like system, right? Like we could easily make one in Savage Worlds. We could easily make one in Pathfinder 2E or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, they, they, they did. I, I totally agree with you. They, they, that's such an interesting twist on like the tribal society that... Um, when you're dealing with them, it's like such a different uh, feeling. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even think I can add anything to that. I mean, that's just, uh, it just makes you want to use them in your game. If you're not, you should, for sure. Because there's... And you can, uh, you can have them be really cute too, which is, that's the best one. Like, <laughs> make really cute ones, you know, like really cute frog art that people are like, don't want to fight just because they're... They're so adorable. That's a fun choice, too. I, I believe that is the last use I have of them, is uh, pull some of those heartstrings. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I mean, So what's a I'm baby a bullywug look like? What's a baby bullywug look like? They look like little frogs, right? And so, well, yeah. Tadpoles. Yeah, right? you're... Well, are they tadpoles? Are they tadpoles? I don't know. Chris. <laughs> I don't, Does anybody know? don't know. Uh, that's that up to cool you. Thing, right? <laughs> like, there could be, like, birthing pools where, like, they're really protective of their little... Uh, babies, you know, or something. Uh, I, yeah. know. I know in uh, a World of Warcraft, which they have the Murlocs, which I'm going to say fill oh. a sim similar position. They they yeah. do have little uh, baby ones, but they walk around. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, right. opened up a whole can of worms, I guess, <laughs> kind of. So <laughs> can of tadpoles, yeah. So, well, well, that's pretty cool. So um, I I think that is a great creature. Is there anything special about the way you'd play them? Um, uh, yeah, you know. yeah. These these are pretty good. I think like uh, they're good for like hit and run tactics, ambushes, like using that camouflage or or environment that they are so familiar with. Um, <clears throat> fog, rain, uh, in and out of water. I, I think that they provide a lot of uh, more interesting uh, combat too, rather than just like goblins or something. Very cool. Very cool. So, any uh, last last thoughts about the Bullywog before we move on? Good stuff. Good stuff. Use them in your game. They're cool. Yep, they are cool. That's pretty cool. So, all right. So that is the beauty of the Bullywug. I, I just like saying it. Oh, Bullywug. That's a, good, that's a good tagline. Like that's a good propaganda propaganda campaign for them. The Bullywug. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, that's cool. That's Creature Corner. Hope you enjoyed it. We're we'll do some more of those. Um, you know, with the different creatures that you might play in your game but let's get right to the main topic so the main topic tonight is we're talking about game mastering and some player advice for small rpg parties and so the first question and, I, and i'll run it tonight I'll, I'll take the the reins of of the mc uh, so what do we mean by a small party versus a regular party. So Chris, what, what do we mean by a small party? Small party here is one to two players, GM and a couple of friends. Uh, I, I, I usually, this, this for me is usually my family or my kids. I mean, that's a personal way that I run it, but that's how usually I'm running it. So it is a very small, intimate party. 
so that so I I agree that it's it's really it's one or two. Um, so some people think, well, is three a small party? It's it's really one or two people because of kind of the the just this very small, intimate, almost in, in a lot of people think more one on one is is even small. But I, I raise it up to two players, and the reason I think about that is uh, I had a game that I ran called Vampire Empire, which was kind of uh, two special agents trying to keep vampires from taking over human lands, sort of a, uh, uh, you know, in the modern time sort of thing. And so it was really nice to have two agents that's very intimate. It was a lot of fun, just, but they played off each other a little bit. So it wasn't just purely this, this just me and you and you've got everything. So it was, it's, I, I really think one or two players is what we would call a small party. Eric, you got any other thoughts on that, I mean, I'm probably in the same I, same agreement, right? Yeah, I mean, same agreement. I, I do think that it depends on the system, right? I mean, like, some systems handle this better than other, or, like, narrative sim- si- narrative systems will be maybe an easier time depending. But, like, sometimes three players can still be a small party. Like, something like Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I would say a lot of this advice probably still applies. Although Pathfinder 2nd Edition has, like, a variant rule to help with this. Um, uh you know, certain games like that, when there's like a lot of skills, I think we'll get into that. You might, this advice would still be helpful for like three players even. But yeah, generally it's two or one for sure. All right, fair enough. So I guess the next question is, it's like, um, we've, we're doing a whole show on advice for doing it. So the, there's there's kind of a, a sub contest, you know, sub current that says maybe this is tough to do. So why would you want to do it? What are What are the benefits of kind of keeping the party small, like that one or two players, very intimate setting. So, um, Eric, what do you think? What What are the benefits? Why would we want to do this in the first place? <laughs> I mean, flexibility, like Chris said, I think a lot of people like, you know, if it's just, if it's your family, that they might be the only people that you have that are willing to play. And that's what you, you know, you're not trying to invite other people in. Um, it could be that you're in an isolated area, right? Um, it could also be you just want a different experience. I mean, it's, it is going to be an entirely different experience, like you said. Like the fun that you had with those two players was because the nature of the campaign is just going to be different because of that dynamic. And so that's another big reason is that like you will be have a much more investment in those in specific character stories. I mean, you, you can really really expand upon these specific characters and the world that they're in way more than you can with three and up, right? Um, so I think those are the two main re- two of my main reasons. I don't know if you guys have any more. Yeah, and I think you're hitting it kind of on the head, right? Is is if you look at media, a lot of media, books, movies, TV, they're about a person who's got yeah. supporting cast, but it's really it's about a person or a couple of people. Um, so the, the concept of having a party of five people all with different niches that they fill is actually not that – it's not as typical as one would think. You know? So it's, it's true, it's, yeah. there's a lot of stories and campaigns that you want to tell or you want to experience that you, you can – do much easier when you have just one or two people. So, so Chris, what do you think about um, what, you know, you, you, obviously you talked about, you have family that's available and what, what other reasons might you do it? Uh, I, I did, as you guys were talking, remember another time I've done this, uh, and I think was pretty successful is as sort of a side panel, as a, a side quest for only one character or for digging into the backstory. Yeah, and I, yeah. I recall we did it between sessions. So it was just me and one person and we really, we, there was some uh, issues with their backstory. I can't remember what it was, but we were able to flush that out to find resolution. And, and this was a time that character had gone away too. So we did this this whole little adventure. They went away. We came back, and there was new motivations, new information, huh. uh, new new like re, re, uh, renewed vigor to play their character. It was it was actually pretty nice. That's cool. That that is yeah, that is I, cool. Yeah. I've also seen this, like, if you have time, you could almost do little mini campaigns for, like, each player before they actually come together, too. Which I've seen that happen, too. Like, really flesh out some of their some of their backstory before they, you know, the meetup in the beginning of the main campaign happens. So, similar to Chris's thing, I think that's another variant that can be applied to this. Okay. Yeah, and if you look at my, my Discord backboard, my Discord uh, history, a lot of it is exactly what you just said. Me and new characters going over their history before we do the first... Yeah. Uh, real session after session zero cool that that is that is that is cool yeah and i remember we uh didn't we um when we were doing the um uh the the chicago <laughs> plex game uh with the coins wasn't that just like a couple of players that everybody else was gone um no one could make it and then it was just you and another person um just going and 
running an yeah. adventure and doing a couple of set. I think it was a couple of sessions to get through that. Yeah. Um, so it, it, even that just a, as a filler, it, it's kind of fun to do that too, like a mini campaign um, filler. Yeah. So, all right. So um, those are a lot of whys. So, you know, the, the, some of it was because it's convenient because that's who we've got because, but there's some benefits. I think there's a lot of benefits for, and we alluded to a few of them. So Chris, what, Let's talk about the benefits of having a small party that you're game mastering for. What are some of the things you get out of it? Uh, I think the, uh, one of the biggest ones is, is merely focusing on the one or two characters or their backstory. Like it kind of spotlights them. It, it, it brings out their stuff without making anybody else feel like they're sort of getting left behind because there are less people waiting on the side. Uh, let you dig into that, uh, dig into them, get even get help them get a feel for their character because they are actually getting more face time or more speak time. Um, mo- mostly, like you know, for my point now is it's just just character story, character arc, intimacy. Uh, those are the big ones for me. Yeah, I, I think um, the the intimate part of it is you, you kind of you hit that is it's a very um, it's a very visceral, right? It's just you and one person potentially role playing each against each other, bouncing off. It's 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 very it's it's almost more personal than sort of a group of of players. Um, you know, I I you know I have I remember this Vampire Empire game. There was the players ultimately went in front of a Senate committee, and it was just it was just this most intense emotional thing as they were testifying to this panel of, of guys who were trying to, um, you know, uh, they didn't believe vampires were real. And these guys were trying to convince them that there's good vampires in the world and all that kind of stuff. And it was just, it was just so visceral. I mean, to think that a Senate committee meeting would be that much fun, but it was just because it was just <laughs> them and me going back and forth. So, uh, Eric, what do you, what do you think of, of some of this? Yeah. I mean, as you said before, I think, I think a big benefit of, of it is that it opens up so many other types of stories. Like you said, like when we look at media, most books, most movies, most TV shows are centered on one person or two people as the main character. Right. So there's all of that type of storytelling that is kind of not there you know, it's always the kind of same dynamic often with these games, when, the, when these party people, right? Um, and we love that, but it, you are missing a whole segment of it. Um, and you can also play with things like giving those people more power. You know, when, when I've been in larger games where it's like the GM, you know, does stuff like if it's an isekai type of game or something or wh- whatever the reason, they're like giving you extra stuff, like tons of extra items or extra power ups. That stuff unravels quickly, but the games that I've played where it's been smaller and that, and they give you the extra stuff, that flows much better. So you can also play with games where you are, um, you know, super powering up the main characters, basically the, the players, because it just will flow better with a smaller party. Um, that's another benefit I see. And uh, another one I want to talk on that's kind of what Chris was talking about, but even beyond like get, getting to the backstories, just just the role playing. If if it's with players that enjoy role playing, then that is going to be a very rewarding experience. Um, you, you don't have to as much, not, like, it's fun to have different perspectives, of course, with a larger party, and, but sometimes it's a struggle if, there, if there's different levels of role-playing, like, not competency, but I guess I would say role-playing, like, uh, role-playing, people who want to do that as much, you know, but if you really want to get into, a, like, a real strong role-playing type game, then, then, sh- then having a smaller party of, of people who like to role-play, right, um, will really encourage that. And you can really, really go deep, like you talked about, like in that Senate committee, right? Um, where you could have a, a lot of fun with that and there was no there was no having to worry about other people. I think we, we've touched yeah. on this. Yeah, there but, wasn't, there wasn't yeah. like a fighter sitting, you know, the guy who's the shooter yeah. sitting on the side Being twiddling bored. his thumbs because these two people were talking constantly, talk, talk, talk. No, everybody was involved because there was only two of them to be involved. Um, and to go back and forth uh, on things. Um, and, and in that game, it's also another thing is it, it went really, f- things went fast. That's the other side of it. The, the, the story moved quickly because there was very few people making decisions. One or two people, they make the decision, they decide what they're going to do, and things move fast. There's, there's not the five people arguing which door to open and, 
you know, whether they're, they're going to go here or go there or what have you. And, and what five are going, two are going shopping, three are going here and two are, it's like, we're going to go do this. And in this game, that, that was a big deal in the vampire empire. Cause it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go here. Okay. We went there, we got something done and now we're back together and we're ready for the next, the next challenge. So that can also be a benefit. And it's also a challenge and we'll get to that in a second too. So <laughs> there's a, there's a other side of the coin to some of these, uh, these items. So any, any other benefits that, uh, you guys can think of that, um, you know, obviously, like we said, story, intimacy, everybody gets spotlight. Um, we get the focus. I, I think we alluded to, we really get the focus on the character's backstory. They're, it's front and center, each character, because that's where you're, you don't have to feel like somebody's not getting their story told or their arc because it is the one player and you can really mind that story and, and, and do that. And we talked in previous episodes how lots of times, Eric, you do a really good job of your backstory. So very often your story is more front and center than maybe some of the others who don't write very write backstories. Some of the folks don't even write backstories. And so here it's, here it's, you don't have those other players who are kind of coming along for the ride. Everybody's on the ride for, for real. So, um, all right, cool. Um, so I, I alluded to it, and so there, there's challenges, though, right? So this is there's a lot of fun. It could be a very rewarding experience. There's some benefits, but there's this is a two sided coin, and there's some challenges that come that come part of that. So, Eric, what what do you see as some of the challenges that a game master would run into when we start talking about a small party of one or two individuals? Uh, I mean, number one, it which is the biggest one probably, is they're not going to be well rounded. I mean, it depends on the, the type of system they're using. Like, I think a more narrative system, this is not as big of an issue, but more mechanical systems like D&D or Pathfinder, or even stuff like Savage Worlds, you're just not going to have a well-rounded party. And you can give them you can give them more like what I said, power as far as like in combat power, right? But as far as character roundness, like being proficient in the different types of gameplay, that's always going to be a struggle. And if even if you artificially like, okay, you just get more skills, it, it might not feel right because what, what the, both of these characters are just like ultra power Mary Sue's that can do everything, right? That's not really fun either in that way. So I think that is a huge struggle is how do we deal with, you know, not, not again, not like how do we deal with combat because you can, as a GM, you can scale combat you know, to them, or you can provide allies or you can provide, um, you know, giving them power ups in that way. But as far as the making more rounded, you know, it doesn't just work in my opinion, just to like, okay, you guys all get more skills because it, it just won't feel right. It won't make sense. It won't be most of the time won't be natural to like a true character uh, concept. Right. Yes. So I yes. think number one, that is like the big, that is the big one. Uh, clouds written in the sky. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Because a lot of games require niches to be filled, right? I mean, you know, D and D yeah. classic is a classic one, right? There's niches and they need to be filled. And if you've got, you're not going to have a fighter, cleric, magic user, thief character. <laughs> you, know, you could, I guess, but you're not probably going I mean, yeah, to. So. E even with like just Stalt, which is I think what say in D and D and Pathfinder, which Stalt is when you basically take two different classes. If we're talking about a class based system and smush them together, right? Pathfinder and D and D have rules for that um it still doesn't totally help as far as like you know skill breath and i would and and even like breath as far as the type of characters you are and the situations they can handle and role playing right if you like your character might be a gruff kind of uh loner and the other character might be just super like a noble who's very like prim and proper but you're still missing out on even character types so it's still filling in that void as far as just like the type of situations they might encounter or you know having it be different every time they encounter something. I think that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Chris, what do you think? What, what are some of the challenges you see? Uh, I, I mean, I fully agree that that's the big challenge there is missing skills. Uh, but I do have an accidental benefit for that, for that challenge, is if, if you are doing these uh, small groups as a predecessor to a bigger campaign, then as they are figuring out how they pick locks without lock picking or you know do magic without having magic when they actually do enter the party later as you get to the main main campaign 
they will then have, you know, well, my character used to do this to solve these type of problems. And now I'm working with the team and there's a person for that. But I got to reconcile, like, just smash the door down with my axe versus let the thief <laughs> pick, the, you know, pick the lock. So at least it gives some kind of character flavor, you know, over the, over the course. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so I, I think we did hit upon this a little bit, and I think uh, we talked about the intimacy, how, you know, there's a lot of RP and you can really go back and forth. Um, but too much spotlight can be a bad thing, right? You don't get a chance to rest, you know, the, the, um, cause it, let's say role playing can be very emotional, right? It can be very, it takes a lot of, a lot of emotional energy and you get, you can get burnt out. You don't have a chance to sit yeah. back and let someone else take the spotlight for a while. Um, you know, the, you don't have that opportunity. Um, you know, GM also, right. At the same time, they're burning out because they're used to the party talking to each other for like 20 minutes back and forth role playing and they instead they're like constantly on with this one player who also has to be constantly on so that's that's a that's definitely a challenge that um could happen um as you're going through things um what other what other items uh challenges that we might face that you guys see uh just carrying on that one uh if you are if a character or player is spending more time uh diving into topics that maybe more, you know, more charge for them. They're very connected to the character. They feel, you know, very empathetic connection. Uh, uh, just monitoring the the players themselves might become an issue. Like they've had enough. I need to switch to something else now because I've dived into this, and obviously they're having you know real emotional connections here, and I I got to give them a break. And like you said, usually you can do it to another player, but if there is no other player, there has to be some other method of winding down for a bit. Yeah, I think overall, it's just, even expanding on that more, it's just an overall way greater onus on the Game Master. I mean, it, we're talking about role-playing, for sure, but also things like, you know, uh, if, you're t if you're talking about a system like D&D or Pathfinder that has a CR system or whatever, or other games that have similar kind of things, how do I balance combat now, right? That's just going to be more work for the Game Master, usually, um, unless it's a narrative game. Um, you also have to be even more so than a normal party, the game master and the player have to be way more just in sync as far as what kind of game they want to run, how they run it, the style of gameplay, all those things. Like you said, like you know, they have you have to be on the same page, like way more so than a normal size party. Because if if like, like like we kind of alluded to, like if if you know the role playing, if they're not invested in the kind of things that you're invested in, and they're not like okay, I like playing around with all these different types of, you know, I, I don't want to just do combat, combat. I like doing combat, then role playing, and then social thing, and then this. And if you have a player who's not into that, one, one even one of them, if, it, if it's a two-player party, then you're really going to feel that way more than a large party, which can usually even, you know, pull up the slack as far as the other players would go, as far as filling those roles that you're, that you're bringing to the table, right? Like investing in what you're doing. So you, you really just have to have the right type of players. And it's not... There's no universal thing here because each game master is going to be different, but you have to have the right type of players for the game that you want to do and, and way more so. That, so that's like a big cautionary tale for me is that really, really, you know, and we've talked about this a lot with Session Zero stuff is like out of any other type of game, this is the one you want to make sure that all of you guys are on the same page. I really cannot stress that enough. Yeah, there, there's so only a couple a, people, but the, yeah. both those people have to be pretty much sure that because there, there's no... You know, I'm doing this because Fred likes combat, so I'm okay with combat, but I really want to role play. <laughs> if it's just you and if you want to role play, well, then you got to you want to role play. So, <laughs> yeah, so there, there might be like a maturity level, you know, minimum for this type of thing to really do it well. Yeah, for sure. Or it has to like meet your maturity. Like if you're super immature, yeah. then I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but guess, usually game that. masters are a cut above, right? Usually game masters are yes, yes, a we are. So I guess that's a cut above. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess that's back to being in sync with the player. Yeah, which yeah, was, which yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think I mean, and then also talking about combat. Like I think we've touched on it, but I think combat can be very, you know, because you're probably going to have to. We'll talk about this in the advice section, but because you're going to have to bolster them up in some way, um, you might. Overplay. It's a lot bigger of a balancing act than it is with a, a larger party, right? You 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 tend to 
the, because the players, because action economy in most games that we do is usually the biggest factor, right? As far as balance between en the enemies that are published and players, it's usually about action economies, you know, in, in a lot of these cases, um, that balance is totally off. So the, 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 act, the balancing act that you're going to have to do as a game master as far as making satisfying combat is just much tri trickier and can go out of hands much quicker. I mean, you, can, you know, I think so. I think generally you want to kind of side with playing it on the soft side until you get the hang of it, right, with how you set up the game. I think it's just play it safe, just play it real safe until you've really, even if you're an experienced game master, if you've never done a one or two person um, party before, then just play it safe. That, that's what I would say. Uh, I'm sure you guys can expand on this. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, the, the classic wade through opponents, um, you know, wave after wave of opponents because I've got, you know, the high damage person and I've got the protective person and I've got the, you, you, again, we don't have all those niches filled. So you really do have to tailor combat. And we'll talk about this a little bit in advice to, to understand that there's a single character coming in and, the player also has to then, you know, from a player standpoint, recognize that they are alone and they may have to take different approaches to problems. Um, and that goes back to maturity, right? The maturity level of the players and, and the thought process. And um, you can't just, if you're all by yourself, you can't just wade in to a bunch of foes. You might have to find a different approach to it. Um, so, so, and, then, and I think there's one last thing. Um, we talked about the game moving faster. It might move too fast. I, you know, I was uh, I was thinking back to material for this game that I had, where I had the two players, and I would put material together that I thought would last a session or or two sessions, and they would just blow through it because <laughs> made a decision, did a thing. You go there, I'll go here. Oh, we'll yeah. get this done. We'll do this. Okay. Oh, we we learned that the vampires are at the are, are trying to ship the the weapon out through the boat yard at midnight, we're going to go find them. And it's like, holy smokes, you, you, you went through the warehouse and you went through this like instantaneously and just like that. And even with combat, because they were in there and, you know, it was a modern, so a lot of bang, bang, bang. And this was a Savage Worlds game, you know, and so combat's already fast. So it's like, shoot, shoot, shoot. People are dead. We figured stuff out. We go to the next thing. So it can almost go too fast. So, um, you know, so that's another, that's another danger sometimes. All right. So any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll get into some advice. How do we get over? I, oh, go ahead, Chris. I have one more. Uh, some of the abilities for the characters may not be useful in a single player uh, party, such as mm. support roles or uh, abilities where you protect an ally or something like that. So that's just something to keep in mind is that uh, you don't want them selecting abilities or spells or whatever that they're not going to get to use. That's so a really good front, point. That should be good. Yeah. That's like the opposite of niche, right? That that the game you're playing is going to be very particular because there is only one player, and like we, we you know, we're talking about a lot of um, media. So yeah, I mean that's a great that's a great point, uh, and that that's something to work with the player on to make sure that they're picking stuff to. And I guess that's a player advice. So we're kind of jumping back and forth there. So um, because we we promised there will be some player advice, so <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and and talk about um, kind of the advice and maybe tick off some of these these items as we go along. And I'm going to uh, I think I'll hand it to, to Chris to start with. Um, so thinking some of these challenges, you know, well roundedness, the role playing side, combat, action economy, things go fast, not not having the right niches filled. What 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 are some of the things we can do from um, you know maybe that we don't have the well roundedness that we would normally have in a game? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so first thing we want to do is I, I identify what's missing, right, and then try to fill that gap. And I think that this is something that uh, I think you want to handle in multiple ways. If it if it were me, uh, maybe there are some items uh, limited use that would think I can give them that would you know help fill things in or hirelings or. Uh, Servants, you know, whatever the modern term for hire is that, is that still a term, hirelings? I think, yeah, hireling, sidekick, uh, yeah, ally, sidekick, central, ally, yeah, right? If it's savage world, yeah. So make sure they're equipped with that and that there's not an obstacle that they can't uh, tackle, right? It's usually, I mean, you don't have to look too hard, but now you might have to really like some locked door is going to stop the entire event. Yeah, and, and when you're talking about a sidekick, one of the important things is don't turn it into a GMPC, 
That's not yeah. you're not talking about a GMPC. You're talking about somebody there that that they can bounce things off of, has some skills that help round out, but really isn't going to take over and solve the problems for the PC. Um, so that, that's that's an important thing. So it, you know, don't fall to the temptation of. I've got a fighter, so now I have a GMPC wizard and a GMPC thief, and they're doing all the stuff because the fighter can't do any of the stuff, and so suddenly they're to become the main character. Um, so be careful, but a sidekick can be super powerful because it's an extra set of hands, the skill gap it fills in. Um, and it's also, um, strangely enough, I mentioned this, bouncing ideas off of them. They're not real, but the game master... Uh, sometimes just saying things out loud, hearing yourself talk it, walk it through, you know, yeah. and you might bounce it off the game master role playing and the game master, obviously you don't want to give away things necessarily, but um, it, it just, and that goes back to that RP intimacy. It's like this, this is a sidekick or a friend or whatever that you're, that you're, you're dealing with. And um, in, in another th- in my campaign, I had um, these folks, these agents were part of what's called the Homeland Security Force um, and they had agents back at the, um, at the main building who they could call on for s- very specific things. Like if they needed a body to lo- be looked at and understood, they didn't have to do it themselves, right? They could ship the body off. Somebody could do some of that analysis and get back to them with the results while they're doing the rest of the adventure. When you would normally have a healer or somebody like that do that work for you right in the party yeah. at the time, they didn't have to do that. It didn't cripple them. That person was the main, wasn't the main character. They were off screen, and they just fed them information that they could use them to make some, make some decisions. So, uh, you know, like your, you know, pick your favorite NCIS kind of thing, right? There's there's somebody in the back room who's figuring stuff out and helping feed the agents some information that they can make decisions on and then do something. So that that worked out extremely well too. Yeah, I, a little bit just want to finish up and talking about the sidekicks um, as far as advice goes. Um, I think like you guys, totally on point. Don't make it a, a GM PC, but like let them, usually you should let the players like each have their own or um, something like that and have them control them in combat. But the game master yeah. is the one that's role playing yeah. them, right? And, and you usually want to set them up as there's some type of, I mean, obviously with a hireling, but they are not inferior as far as like, I, I, they're, they're like either through like if it's a faction based game they are in a lower rank and the you know the players are the superiors to them or if it's something like a fantasy you know normal kind of fantasy game um, they are like you know the players are the chosen one and these are their their sworn allies or something right so what in whatever case that the players are superior so they have the control as far as the narrative on the player side goes but it's still fun as a game master to then role play them through because it's going to be a completely different dynamic than how you role play you know strangers or enemies right um so i think that's but let them control them in combat that's very important so again it comes down to having the players be um you know good at these kind of things having having players who can handle i can run my character and i can also run this maybe it's a simplified version but maybe it's just like a clear character i don't know like right have them be able to run that in combat because as the game master you don't want to be doing that too it, it will feel a little bit better like the mix i i usually right unless it's like something like maybe chris can talk about with doing it with your kids or something that you might right i'll, I'll let so, you speak yeah. on that yeah yeah, so uh, just talking about how, you know, because they have to run two characters and they don't want to run two character sheets in my experience. That's yeah, difficult. Okay. That you yeah. want, what we what we usually do is we have like specific, you know, sidekick character sheets that are very limited. I yeah. can do this, this, and this, and this is my main thing and that's all. And it works well on like an index card and that is it. This is what yeah. this guy does. Most of his thing is narrative. So just, I have these skills. There's nothing really to man- manage on me. You can write some inventory on the back or whatever, but that's all. So, so as, as simplistic as you can make them, uh, the better, I think. Like an NPC sheet almost. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah. Yeah, like a super small one. And then, but like, unless you have somebody like, say like me, right, who might enjoy like running a full character. So it really just depends. But I think generally, Chris, that is the right idea for sure. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is like, and I think this is on top of what you were talking about, Carl, is that you have to power them up in some way. Now that there's two, there's two, in my mind, there's two main ways that you do that. Either like you said, it's, um, you know, we're not talking about m- maybe not mechanically, but narratively they're powered up. So in your case, they have a whole faction backing them, a powerful faction, right? I think that's what you were talking about is yeah. like, they're able to call in uh, backup. They're able to get like the cream, you know, they don't have to 
worry about money as much. They don't have to worry about transportation as much. They have this powerful faction that, that, that makes them more powerful. Or the other track tack that we take is we, we mechanically make them more powerful. And I think something like uh, like me and Chris play, I think, Chris, you play Pathfinder 2E a lot. Um, there is a uh, multi-class variant in that where you combine two classes and, you know, there's things that you shouldn't do with that. But, I mean, just like I talked about Gestalt before, like you give them either the two dual classes or you give them like, you know, r a powerful relics that upgrade with them. And you might give them like, okay, you have a couple more skills. You shouldn't overdo that, but like a couple more skills. So, like I said, mechanically powering them up. And you might even do some bi uh, variant between these, like a mix of them. I don't think you want to make them you don't want to give them too much like power personally and give them like a super powerful faction in the background that 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 could then break the game and kind of derail it um but like a good uh, a good balance between those is is probably the best way to do that like if we're talking about the the chosen one in a fantasy world you know they're they're just better than the people around them they're they have they have, they have a couple extra attribute raises and a couple other you know more spell slots or something and then they also have the backing of some church or something or a, a nation but they're not like you know really in the ranks of some faction they're still independent so i think you can play with that a little bit but you definitely want to empower them in some way for sure and then the one last thing i'll say to that and this is tricky but it really depends on the, the system um sidekicks help with that but like i said before the the main issue is often action economy if you're playing outside of a, a narrative game action economy is going to be the main way that the mechanics because games are written with that balance usually in mind if we're talking about savage worlds D D. You know, a lot of these mechanical type games, uh, action economy is the thing. Um, but you can play with that. You can give them like tokens where they can play an extra turn or you can call them whatever you want. Um, like outside of Benny's, if it's talking about Savage World, they have a special token that gives them another turn or they might give them like their ability as they get another action, right? It could be that simple. That could be the way they're powered up um, and you can narrate that in different ways, but also look at the playing with action economy and, and powering that up in some way, depending on the system. And, and what's yeah, it? Are, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Jump on in. No, I was just going to, I was just agreeing that that is a good point. The action economy is usually, you know, whatever the ratio is, five to one player actions versus enemy actions is now going to be two to one. And that's a big deal. Yeah. And, and I think uh, kind of even a little bit looking at it from a different angle, um, you can now maybe change the way the game thinks. Because um, a single low level creature becomes much scarier to a single character than a party. So now think of yeah. the kinds of games you can play where you've got a single like werewolf bothering a town. It's not like, you know, a gaggle of them. There's not like a whole den of them that you're going to go and it now you just got one thing you're dealing with as a single character. And it's, it's almost like a horror story. Now it's almost like scary versus we go into the dungeon with overwhelming forces and we're just chopping through goblins left and right. One goblin is now, you know, he's a scary dude <laughs> to go against all on your own. So um, so you can also kind of play with the kind tone, I guess, the tone and the way the game feels For sure. as well. So, um, And on top of that, Carl, I think it I think it's fun to play with how it changes the whole dynamic of the world building itself. Um, often in games when you really start to sometimes when you start to get really logical with like how magic works you're like well none of this makes sense if there's just healing everywhere the whole society would be different and there'd be no walls that there's you know like it starts to break down a lot of things that we just take for granted but uh but if you have if it's, if it's a one or two player game you know classes quote unquote might be extremely rare that might not be the norm you know there might not just be like clerics everywhere you're just just the nature of your main characters having a class or whatever it is might be the unique thing about them that makes them more powerful. And so you can kind of depower the world around them. Like you were talking about, Carl, like that one werewolf, right? Like when there's a party of six people and everybody's a different class and they meet other people with classes, it's just like in general, that might not be a big threat. But if it's just two people that have class, you know, classes, quote unquote, um, even a posse of other people, there might not just be people who, who have the same level of power as the main characters do, right? The, the main yeah. players. There's, there's only one uh, Conan, because, right? There's only one yeah. Conan. <laughs> so there might be like, you know, like a druid is just like, is so rare, right? Or yeah. even a fighter on its own. Like the other fighters are not like that. There's just not other NPCs that are on the same level as uh, whatever the players are, are, are. So you can really play with that um, a lot. And I think you should, right, Carl? Like that's, that's... Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And that will give you a lot more like bang for your buck as far as like, pl you know, using creatures that are published and using published adventures. You can just kind of tweak that. And yeah. 
for sure, for sure. Um, so what about, uh, like, the speed of the game, the pacing? It's going fast. Is it going too fast? Um, you know, obviously more content, more that you can bring to the table, but um, how do we... Do we need to slow it down, or is that fine? I mean, is there what can we do to make it so that the the speed of the game isn't a detriment to the to the fun? What do you I think? I think speed. I think speed going. I think it's going to generally be faster because there's less people. Uh, but I think that players are allowed now to really dive into something without with less people waiting on them. So if they're happy to role play for forty five minutes on something and it doesn't really interfere, I think that's that's good. Uh, but at the same time, I think that that gets uh, sort of, uh, like I said, balanced out with the speed. So, so you're moving at twice this pace and then you have some slowdowns. O overall, it comes out to be, you know, mostly average, a little, you know, with a little bit faster. Uh, so I think that is a, a fairly good thing. Yep. Uh, less, less preparing for the GM too, because uh, what he has one session might last too. Yeah. And, and I think combat becomes less of a core component in a lot of those games. It, mm -hmm. it, it, there's more, like you said, there, there can be more role playing exploration, learning things and, um, you know, versus the combat's just a piece of it. And versus kind of in, let's be honest, in D and D with a large party, the combat becomes a set piece, you know, an entire, you know, entire session may be all about combat. And that's true for a lot of games because of the way things are putting together and it's probably less. And so focus on some of the other areas, um, that, that come into place, I think. All right. Yeah. So, but I think, I think as far as advice goes to this, like if you are finding, cause the problem with it could, can be like with it going too fast, like you said, like it can be going too fast for how you want the narrative to go. Right. And it might be an unexpected thing that's happening. So I think that you can, you can use roadblocks, uh, much more with a small party and it won't feel as bad as with a large party because those roadblocks themselves won't take as long, if that makes sense, to, yeah. to kind of like halt the like forward progress of the one or two players. I think you can utilize roadblocks much more and some of those can be, right, random encounters. I think random encounters in a larger party game is just, to me, just gets horrendous. It gets, you know, used tactfully, tact, tactfully used like sparingly, it, it, it's good. But I, I have so many games I've been in where, with, especially with larger groups, you know, those random encounters, man, they, they, they just kill, kill the narrative. But I think with a smaller party, those can be utilized much more to slow it down if, if you need it to slow down. Because like you said, it, it can be a big problem. Um, and there can be other things like, like puzzles, like a lot of those things that might annoy a larger party, I think can be used to slow down. And that's, I, I don't think you should feel bad about using them because like you said, like, you know, prepping, uh, you might have not have your, you, you might be going way faster than you feel comfortable as far as you're prepping for your story. Right. So, um, I think it's, it's still a valid thing to, to use those type of things. Um, and so having like a larger dungeon, right. With just larger dead ends or, um, things like that, or going much more like we talked about in the last episode, like using nemesis hooks, right. Oh, you can, sure. yeah. you can really, really use nemesis. Cause I'm, you're hoping that the backstories for these players are much larger and that you've worked with them probably much more personally. I think we'll talk about that a little bit in player advice. But, I mean, that's another advice for game masters here is that even more so than any other type of game, work with these players and their backstories. You really, really, really want to have their backstories tied in to the story much more than other ones. Like, I think, Carl, you brought this up where, where in the larger games, you know, the one or two players who write those larger backstories kind of can bolster up the players who don't. In these type of games, it's not you know it's not going to work. Those the players that are in the one player or the two players have to have those you know well not right. well written but have to have the you know the larger uh, broader backstories yeah. that are tied into the there, game. There's, world. there's so, no room for the passive. And when yes, you there is no room for the passive. Yeah. So yeah. work with those work with players to have that backstory really ingrained with the world. You know. Um, and then so you can use their backstories to, you know, with nemesis hooks or use it to bring characters from their backstories out to like, okay, you know, we're going too fast here. I'm going to bring back their, I saw their friends from their village, like they're having a problem. Right. I'm going to bring yeah. them into like role play out and have fun. So you, so you really want to utilize their backstories a lot more too, to maybe slow them down or to beyond just, you know, using it for fun and to, to engage them. You, if, if you've, if you've done the time to make bigger backstories with them, then you can utilize them. That makes sense. That's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, uh, leverage those backstories and, 
backstories are they're always important, but they're super important in in this case for sure. All right. So, and I think you, uh, if there's no other thoughts there, I think you alluded to it that um, what can players do, um, or what's some of player advice who's running, <laughs> who's being run in a small one or two person campaign. Um, what what can they do to I don't know, improve it or be better? or I, I don't know how you want to say it. So I don't know, Eric, did you want to lead this one off? I mean, sure. I mean, I think it, often with the player advice section, it's just the inverse of what we're giving for the Game Master. I mean, I think, you know, uh, as a player, you, you have to be much more open-minded for number one. Like, ju just be more open-minded. Be open, more minded to trying different things that you normally wouldn't do in a game like this. Like, uh, you know, going different directions that you might not think to go. Um... You know, look like leaning way more into role play. Like just be more open to role playing. Be more into, you know, don't don't feel that like kind of let yourself be more unleashed as far as I'm not gonna hog the spotlight as much. It's like, no, hog the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this is obviously with two players. I mean with one player you're obviously only hogging the spotlight. But for a two player game, like even that, hog the spotlight more. Like like go at it. Like go at the game master harder. Like you, you almost have to. You just have to bring more to the table. You have to go at every no matter if it's combat, social situations, you know, whatever hook the game master's giving you, you have to go at it harder. Because there's just not going to be the other players, you know, filling that Right, there's you. no one to lean on. It's all you. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so. Yeah, and I think we we. Go ahead, Chris. So I think we alluded to this earlier. Is about uh, just players can prepare their character for being uh, in a, a, a one or two person party, such as don't take those spells, don't take those abilities that are going to be useless during your course. Oh yeah. Uh, of running the you know of running this small adventure. So I don't. If you're a support class, of you know who are you supporting? If, if you're the only one there, maybe that's not maybe that's not a good choice. It's true, yeah. Supporting the sidekick, who then becomes the main character. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and there, there's, I mean, I feel like there's certain like animators or something where their support character is powerful, but yeah. Um, and I, and I, to that point, like I think, uh, as far as engaging with the game master, like that goes beyond just in play. Like even Chris was saying, like be you got to be more communicative with the game master. Like come at them more. Like hey. I really want to play this class or this type of character, but like I'm having, can you like, can we work here with like getting this, you know, like filling out that support character? Maybe can you add some extra things in? Like be, just be way more communicative, be, be way more honest than you normally might would want to be because, you know, it's, it's quickly going to play out if those things are bad decisions either made, you know, mechanically or role playing wise. Um, and I think in, you know, get even more engaged, like, like you're going to have to know more about this world. You're going to have to know more about the genre, like advice I've given before, like that I often do before I start a game, I might like, you know, watch a TV show or a movie or something that is similar to the genre of a game. Right. Cause that helps you get before you even make the character, get into the mindset. Right. And I think that's really important here because you really just have to be more invested. You, you just, in all ways you have to be more invested. So I think using that like as a tip of like. Yeah, like read up on the setting, but also read up on the type of genre. Like, like, like get yourself into that mindset because you're gonna have to make a character that's gonna have to go the long way. You know, it, it's it's gonna have to fill in. It's gonna be larger than life in a lot of different ways, and, even and if it's the, a, a quieter character. Yeah, and obviously the game master can help, right? There's so much yes. fewer of you. You guys can pick a game genre that you both are excited about, and there's no well, you know, these three people want to do. Space Cowboy, ah, it's okay, maybe next time I'll do... No, you all have to be on the same page or somebody's not going to have a good time. So it's... It, otherwise, how are you going to lean into it? So you really, it, it goes back to that, like you said. Um, you be open to learning more about a genre and, and then pick genres that you're both excited about. So any so any other thoughts? What else can a player do to, to help out? Is, is there anything? Lean into... We talked about lean into it. Rich backstories have something the game master can mine that you can um, you can do it. Um, make sure you're not picking skills and abilities that don't make sense. Um, learn learn the genre, understand it, so that it's easier to lean into role playing and and building characters that make sense. Um, anything else that makes sense there, or it's that's pretty good advice to be honest with you for a player. I think. Yeah, 
I think the hog the spotlight was the real good summary here. So you you're always playing game and you always got to wait your turn. Like, well, now it's all your turn, so enjoy it. You know, yeah. soak that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop. And it might be tricky, like, because if, if you're playing a character who is not, um, because you can still play any type of character generally, but it still has to be a character. You know, like when we're talking about like there's the there's the bard, right? They're a charismatic bard who, who's who's always out in front. Like, that's an easy one. Right, but if you're still playing a more kind of introspective scholarly character, you're still going to have to stretch that concept a little bit more. Like that, whatever character you have to play has to fill in, uh, has to fill in more. So um, just think about like, well, how do I make a scholarly kind of more introspective character, more um, you know, uh, ex- introverted character, be that way. And so you have to really kind of logically think that through, and it's probably going to be in their backstory, like. It's, it's going to be up to the game master too. like work with your game master of like, well, what's, you know, the hero's journey, what's spurring them onto adventure? Like, so you're going right. to have to yep. want to take them even more outside of their comfort zone. And they're going to really have to rely on their things to fill in that shoes. So, you know, like, I think we've talked about this before about how role playing isn't just like, you know, in combat, all character, right. There's the fighter character, but there's the, there's the, there's the, the face character. Right. But most games, they still get to all take their turn in combat, you know? And I think there's always that imbalance with in social situations. It's always like, okay, the face character takes total control, but I always think that's not the best way to go. I think that any character, right. Can be, can maybe not hog it. Let the person who's good at it, do it, you know, when they need to. But even if you're playing a gruff, you know, edge Lord, they can still contribute in their way to the social situations. They can still contribute their way into the role playing. Even if you're playing an introverted character, they can still role play. They're just doing it differently. And I think that's the thing that you really have to lean on as far as a player in a one or two person game is that how do I make my, you know, scholarly intro- scholarly introvert take the lead in maybe social situations because that's I have to. So, you think about your approach, so you really have to lean into, well, I'm using my knowledge and logic to take control of social situations. And I think it's something you can work with your game master about, but it does require you to stretch of like, well, how do I, you know, think about when you're making your character, how do I accomplish them, but not in just in combat or, you know, in what they might be good at, like a wizard character in a um, lore check or whatever, like how are they going to approach um, social situations? How are they going to approach exploration challenges? So that's something to like, almost do like a workshop in your mind about, you know, as far as like making this super well-rounded character as far as uh, their personality goes, if that makes sense. That makes total sense. Makes total sense. Well, very cool. Very cool. So any final thoughts? I think we really explored this pretty well. I'm not sure there's um, anything left. So uh, any final thoughts you guys have on small party RPG gaming? Well, I want to know from you guys, because you guys have both done it. How do you, is there any intricacies as far as death goes? Because I would imagine like, especially in a one person game, how do you handle the death or do you put like safeguards in place or something? Because once that one character dies, right, then the the narrative might fall apart. So I'm just wondering if you guys have handled that before. So, so, so in my games, typically when it's a smaller party, the challenges get kind of ramped and modified and... There's a lot more RP and stuff like, and it, death has not really been an issue. So, um, because I'm not giving them those kind of combat situations where it's completely deadly. A lot of it is more the mystery, more the exploration, more the understanding. And combat is just there to add action and some danger, but it's usually not the core component of of the game. So that's that's kind of where I come from. So I. I haven't really killed. I really haven't. And of course, it's a TPK if you killed the one character. And then, but they, there, there's nobody to drag them back to town. So yeah, it can be, it can be dangerous, I guess, out there. Uh, unlike Carl, I have killed him. And uh, <laughs> usually you're bringing character back to salvage the story of the rest of the party. Only there is no rest of the party. So when that character dies, that story could potentially over, right? It is... So I, really, it's like a judgment call, I think, then, is like, how much have we invested? Is it too horrible just to, you know, have another character and start over? And is, is everything that's happened specific to this one person? Yeah. Or is there a way we can salvage us by the next character also somehow has been involved? You know, it's, 
and, and it, therefore the all that time wasn't wasted for the new character. I mean, it's maybe really the sidekick hard to becomes say. the main character, right? And then he yeah, gets a maybe. sidekick. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're playing a baby bullywug. <laughs> you're all grown up. Tadpole's grown up out of the, the birthing yeah. mess. I think. I mean, this goes back to advice, just because I wanted to touch on this because I think it's an important thing. Um, like, I think you guys. I think Chris, that's a really good. You really have to make that judgment call and like talk to the player about it. Um, I think there's a couple things you can do as far as safeguarding. Like, you can have a, you know, you can just kind of, uh, what's it called? Like, you know, have your uh, duess ex machina, am I pronouncing that right, right, kind of thing, your whatever, come in to save the day. I think, though, you can, one of the things that I would recommend is, like, have death be, maybe not be the final. Like, have something happen where there's a negative consequence. Like, maybe this character now has some type of curse or something happened like because they were knocked out for a certain amount of time, like what their resources got. So, like we talked about in the nemesis thing, maybe uh, somebody like the v- people close to them had gotten killed or kidnapped, like make a negative effect that affects them, but they don't really, really die. Right. Because that, if you don't want the game to end, then that, that's what I would recommend is like have the death be meaningful as far as like there is consequences either personally or yep. narratively in the world. Right. Yeah. But so I think that's the way to lean into it. If you don't want the game to end is, is like, yeah. has this there be like serious the, consequences? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. That's like the uh, uh, Nigo Montoya thing, right? Is they yeah. don't get killed, but they get a scar on each cheek and you're going to hunt this guy for the rest of your life. Yeah. They've created a new enemy or the village they've been protecting got destroyed by the demons or the bandits or whatever, or they have some curse and they can't, you know, their memory is fractured. Right. So they have to do like a side quest now to get their memory back. So so have weight to it. Have there be consequences. But I think there is ways to get around that character death just as far as if you want to keep the game going, you know, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Good. Good point. Excellent point. So. um, All right. Well, excellent. Um, Well, hey, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you got something out of it. Remember to drop by MasteringTheRPG.com to learn about all the other projects we're working on. Contact and support us. Please email Game Master at MasteringTheRPG.com. If you have questions, need some advice, um, Eric still would love to adjudicate differences of opinion. <laughs> he loves that. He loves it. Um, I do. I do love that. And you can see it in our game. We play every Friday. He likes to, you know, differences of opinion with the, the guys and help them pick characters and do all sorts of stuff like that. So um, if you like the show, help us with a positive review in the podcatcher of your choice. We'd love to keep doing the show and, and it's kind of fun and you know, now it's fun. We got Chris. So um, once again, I'll say this is Carl with Eric and Chris. Say goodbye, guys. Happy game. Goodbye. Have a good time. <laughs>